All right, let's stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word. And please find first our 2 Corinthians, thank you, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We'll be looking at verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10. It's very warm this evening. If, if it doesn't bother anyone, I'm going to take off my, my jacket. Are we good with that? All right. I think it's only polite that I should ask you. And I appreciate you are, your understanding. It is warm. Whew. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 4, the Bible says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, there's one more verse I want you to read with me. Find Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18. In Matthew 16, 18, the Bible says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Father, help me to preach. And I do believe uh, with, with equal fervency and, uh, and uh, concern, Lord, I pray each one here will be given that the blessing of ears to hear. So anoint me and help me, Father, to deliver under the anointing of the Holy Spirit the message you have for us. And then put the eye sap necessary on every eye here and, and help their ears, Lord God, to be open. And we might receive what you have for us tonight. For it is in Jesus Christ's name that I pray and ask for that. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to be gone this coming Sunday. I'll be in North Carolina with the uh, um, Community Baptist Church in Siller City with Pastor Mark Agin. And we'll be doing a spiritual warfare conference. We tried hard to organize that conference from Monday through Wednesday. And at the time, trying to put the tickets together to make that happen, just it wasn't working. So we ended up going ahead and pushing it to Sunday. So I'll be gone Sunday through Wednesday. But then Pastor Nathan decided to change his wedding date. So he moved that to June the 6th, I think. Yes, June the 6th. So if you are not happy with this, get mad at Pastor Nathan. He needs a little bit of that anyway to break him in. <laughs> I'm teasing <laughs> But anyway, so he's uh, moved his wedding date to June the 6th. It makes zero sense for me to come home June 4th, fly back out June 5th to be there for the... It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to go ahead and stay and then try and to organize a trip home because the wedding is on, I think, Saturday. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. To, I'm not going to travel on Sunday. It's against my religion. So I don't travel on Sunday, but uh, that means I'm coming back Monday. So that pushes everything over to, for, so I'll be gone two Sundays. Now we've got this Sunday covered. Uh, next Sunday is tentatively covered. Uh, I can't announce it yet because he doesn't know it yet. <laughs> I'm half teasing, but anyway. Um, but I'm looking forward to, uh, and by the way, I watch all the messages that are preached while I'm gone. Got to keep, got to keep tabs of things on, you know, Amen. But uh, so I'll be looking forward to uh, hearing uh, Pastor Nathan present the Sunday school lesson. His father, uh, Deacon Campbell, will be preaching in the pulpit Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, Pastor Nathan will be preaching. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God has for us through those men of God while I'm gone. Uh, that coming Wednesday, we got a little bit of confusion. It's probably going to be our youth pastor, Brother Peter. Amen. We got a deep line up here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Amen. And all of these men are excellent. They're all very good. You'll, you'll enjoy them. Uh, just don't enjoy them too much, you know, because when I get back, I want you to have missed me. I'm just teasing, of course. Uh, the following Sunday, like I said, I've got some things working. Brother Peter and I were talking about it, but I got to I got to speak a little bit more to some people before I can announce it. But we'll make sure it's covered. If it isn't covered, I'll just hitchhike home. And then take care of it that way. But we'll make sure it's covered. All right, here we go. So, uh, having said all that, let me say also this. 
I'm going to interrupt our series on spiritual, uh, not spiritual warfare, but on prayer and fasting. But this is this material is so part of that subject. It's not even going to feel like we're talking about something different. <clears throat> but uh, I feel like I need to further develop preparation for our church to go into our month of prayer and fasting. So I'm going to keep doing that. And in order, because that's so important, uh, in order to make sure we stay in touch with one another and we keep moving that forward, I do an evening visit. Many of you have jumped on once or twice. Some of you get on every night when I, when I, when I go live with that. But I'm going to encourage you for the next week while I'm gone to pay attention to your Facebook alert when I go live. And if you can, jump on with us and participate in the live uh, podcast. If you can't, that's fine. Just remember that you got notified that there's one there. And then go back and get it later because I'll save it and post it and it'll be there for you later on. <clears throat> and I'll be carrying on these messages uh, that prepare us for a season of prayer and fasting in November. <clears throat> now, Let's go to work for what we have tonight. Sunday, I address strongholds. I offered insight on how to identify them tonight. As I mentioned, I believe the Lord wants us to think more deeply about identifying personal strongholds. Remember, I said there are personal and institutional strongholds. Personal strongholds, pretty obvious. That means those strongholds Satan uh, gains in our personal life from which he launches attacks on us and gets control of us in some measure. Uh, he can get a lot of control, or he can have very little control, but he can get a lot done with even a little bit of control. So we need to be careful about any strongholds Satan has set up in our personal lives. He uses the strongholds he sets up in our personal life to infiltrate and establish influence in three, in the three divinely appointed institutions, and so sets up institutional strongholds. Those are a lot more complicated than personal strongholds. Well, in some ways they're more complicated. But they can only happen when he has first established personal strongholds. So we focus there first. So he gains control of a Christian by that, and by that gets territory and, and uh, is able to act in the world with greater freedom. And then he uses that freedom, and he even uses those believers to get strongholds within the family, within the church, and then within the nation, if we give ourselves, if we give ourselves to the power of Satan, then we have exposed our family to the power of Satan. If we expose our family to the power of Satan, we expose the church to the power of Satan. As goes the church, so goes the nation. So when he gets hold of the church, he can then begin to break down the nation. So it's very important we learn how to deal with these strongholds. Remember that Christ spoiled Satan's house, gave his goods to his disciples. He instructed them to occupy, which is a military term, to hold territory, to hold position uh, until he returns. He gave them the keys of the kingdom and the spirit of God. And he warned us, don't give any place to the devil. The only way Satan gains place in the earth today is when Christians yield it to him. Satan's purpose is to oppose the rule of Christ in the earth and in our lives. And he will steal, kill, and destroy mankind to accomplish that goal. His strategy is to neutralize the only power on the planet that can get in, the, that can get in his way. And the only power on the earth that can get in the devil's way is the church. And the church, of course, is made up of God's people who are kings and priests unto God and in whom dwells the Spirit of God and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we're his threat. We are his threat. Back in the day, before Christ came, the center, uh, the focus of Satan's attack and the warfare was centered on uh, the halls of power in the world. Palaces, kingdoms, uh, throne rooms uh, of kingdoms. But Jesus came, and that changed. Now, the center of the conflict is the Lord's churches. That's ground zero in the war for the soul of this nation. It's in the churches, and it's really all the way around the world. So, keeping that in mind, let's talk about those personal strongholds. A personal stronghold, of course, is any area in your personal life that Satan controls. He uses, I'm going to go past some of this stuff, amen. 
He uses anger, he uses fear, and he uses lust to gain control of our lives. Anger, fear, and lust. And he will sometimes use strongholds he has achieved through anger in order to bring you under the power of lust. He will sometimes use a stronghold he's established in fear or through fear and use that to bring you under the power of some lust of the flesh. Peter said the lusts of our flesh war against the soul. So the ultimate objective of Satan is to get us to get our affections set on things below, to get our affections drawn down into and connected to and bound up in the lusts of the flesh. When he achieves that, then he's got control of our lives. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Let's begin with anger. We'll probably only get through the anger-based strongholds tonight. And then, Lord willing, tomorrow night, uh, during my uh, counsel and comfort for the present distress visit online, my live stream, I'll go into the fear-based issues. And then Friday night, you see what I mean? I want to keep this going. I don't want it to be the case that since I've, I leave, it all just sort of, you know, stops moving forward. Of course, I trust those who will be preaching will, will take care of that, but we're going to all make sure it's getting taken care of. Amen. Here we go. So anger is outrageous. Have you ever read that one? It's in Proverbs 27, verse number 4. Anger is outrageous. That word outrageous means that it overflows. It suggests to us that if it's not controlled, anger will suddenly flood your emotions and overtake your will. We used to live out in Guadalupe. We'd have these heavy rains come in, and it, was, it would wash out certain roads. I remember one uh, afternoon I was driving home, and I liked to use, I think it's Brown Road that runs across the, the, what used to be the river out there. I can't remember right now. It's been that long since I've lived out that way. But there was this road we used a lot. And I kept thinking, maybe I shouldn't use that ward, that, that road, because it gets flooded pretty fast. Well, I used it, and it did. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I should have listened. That was probably the Lord. So I went on that road, and I got down there, and I thought, well, maybe I'll make it. And all of a sudden, thunder, clap, rain, pour, deluge, and in, in seconds, that road was flooded out. I couldn't get across it. That's how quickly that can happen. Well, anger is like that if you're not careful. Anger can suddenly... Just, whoom, flame on. And you're under its power, and it's directing your behavior. The Greek word translated anger is one that has a root, the meaning of which is to abandon one's self to a passion. It's pronounced orge in Greek. We pronounce it orgy. It means to abandon oneself to a passion. And that word is translated anger. In our Bible. It's not the only word translated anger, but it's the word translated anger in most of the instances. And this word means to suddenly come under the power of a passion. In the, in the case of anger, of course, it's usually a passion of hatred or resentment or wrath. Well, anger. Anger, however, all by itself, isn't a sin. The Bible says, as I pointed out before, in Ephesians 4.26, be ye angry and sin not. So God tells us to go ahead and be angry, but when you get angry, don't sin. Jesus became angry at the self-righteous who would elevate their religious code over the human needs of their fellow men. And that story is in Mark chapter 3. You might want to take a look at it later. We don't have the time to go into it farther than to say there was a man who was sick, who needed attention, and the Pharisees were all uh, concerned about violation of their special rules governing the Sabbath. Not even the biblical rules gov governing it, but their special rules. And Jesus, the Bible says, and here's the point of it, Jesus looked on them with anger. So we must not hold on to anger. We must be ready to quickly put it away from us. Ephesians 4.31 and Colossians 3.8. Satan knows if you are an angry, prone individual. And he will work to bind you with anger or to anger. He's going to orchestrate perhaps a major event or a series of events calculated 
to make you angry. Or he'll watch for some event like that to occur and take advantage of it to jump on it and do his work to encourage you to respond to that event with an intense outburst of anger. Remember, Satan can take captive those under his power at his will. 2 Timothy 2.26. Speaking of those who oppose themselves, by the way. Uh, and we're supposed to preach to them and teach them in hopes that they will recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. I want you to hear that. We preach and teach the Word of God to those who oppose themselves in hopes that they will repent to the acknowledging of the truth and by doing that, recover themselves from the snare of the devil. Now keep that in mind because that's going to be important to us as we move a little, far, a little farther along. Satan has to gain access from God to get to us. For the wicked or the evil or those who are without Christ, Satan has access to them at his will. But he does not have automatic access to us. He has to get permission, if you will. A great illustration of that is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, 31, 32. Jesus is at the Last Supper table, and he's talking to his disciples, preparing them for his departure. And all of a sudden, he interrupts himself. You've got to read it sometimes. It's very interesting if you pay attention to the narrative as it's developed. Jesus is talking about all kinds of other topics, and then all of a sudden, he interrupts himself and says, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan hath desired thee, desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art comforted, or when thou art converted, excuse me, strengthen thy brethren. Um, Satan had to get permission in order to access Satan. I'm sorry, to access Peter. Uh, Peter. So you have this picture of Jesus talking to them. At, meanwhile, he's keeping an eye on what's going on in heaven. Satan has petitioned the throne of God and asked for access to Peter. This is a beautiful picture of Christ, our advocate, because Jesus is right there and he advocates on behalf of Peter. And he says, I have prayed for you. So when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. So there's a whole lot there to, to milk. I mean, there's a lot of milk there uh, to, to draw from and that would nourish us and many uh, and give us great insights in so many different ways. But for tonight, you see that Satan has to get permission to get to us. How does he gain that permission? Usually it's through some smaller stronghold that he's already established. Now, I've preached on that passage Several times I've offered all kinds of insight and suggestions on what it might have been in Peter's life or personality that Satan was able to capitalize on, establish a little toehold there, and then use that at the opportune moment to go before the throne and get access. It could have been pride. You remember it was Peter who said to Jesus, oh, nobody's going to hurt you when I'm around. Uh, don't, Jesus said, I'm going to die on the cross, be buried, and rise again. And it's almost as if Peter is saying, oh, quit being such a, uh, an Eeyore. Some of you have never read, the, uh, what's that little bear's name? Yeah, Penny, Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, I almost said Penny the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. I forgot that. Anyway, so don't be mother grubbing. Don't, don't you worry about that. I'm, you know, Peter stepped in and arrogantly, really, uh, attempted to, really dissuade Jesus from fulfilling his purpose and his mission. Outrageous. But he came under the power of Satan back then. So Satan, so I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Peter had an area in his life that Satan was able to, uh, kind of a, uh, like a landing spot in Peter's life where Satan could get there and land and then use him from time to time. And uh, in here was a case in point. Now, I bring all that out because we're talking about strongholds. Does Satan have a landing pad in your life? Does he have some place that he can just sort of put it in his pocket and say, I'll, I, I can use this later? And then draw it at an opportune time and say, Father, let me at him. Now, you don't need to be overwrought and concerned. Your advocate, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, will stand for you as he did for Peter. And your salvation is secure and all that good stuff. But that doesn't change the fact that Peter faced a major temptation and experienced a huge fall in his life. Because he left a landing pad for the devil in his life. So you want to make sure you don't, you don't do that. If the experience is emotionally intense, then Satan can more easily bind you to anger from that experience. Now, as a pastor, of course, I come across situations where I'm counseling people who've gone through some serious trauma. I mean, they've dealt with some huge, huge issues. And I find often that that event in their life is a place where the, is the tap root from which has sprung all kinds of evil in their life. Just all kinds of stuff. And uh, Satan wants to do that. Uh, sometimes if he has access through somebody around you, he'll use them to get to do that. If you don't have a shield and protection somewhere or a covering, then Satan gets at you. We're going to go into a whole set of messages on the question, why would God allow the devil to possess a child? How does that happen? And we're going to do that in connection with our question, do devils possess animals? And if so, why does God allow that to happen? And it, you'll understand, but it takes some time to develop that from Scripture just so you can see what's going on there. But uh, these things are very real. Um, our own stewardship over our home in maintaining the hedge and the covering spiritually for our homes, hugely important. We can leave a gap. We can leave a hole in the hedge. And we can allow the devil to get in and wreak havoc in our homes. So we need to understand all those things. And we will be addressing all those things. I bring it up now because I've introduced something that's going to cause you perhaps to go off and think about that. But I come back here. Let's think about this right now. The fact that Satan can either capitalize on an event that happens. Or he can orchestrate an event if he has enough access that will attack you in such a way as is calculated by him to solicit from you an intense emotional response of anger. And the more intense, the better. And if he can get you to become really, really angry, he can, he can bind you to that. Like that woman that was bound by Satan for 18 years, he can bind you to an, a, an anger, anger at a moment in your life and then a root starts developing, it becomes bitterness, and it bears all kinds of fruit, and all oh, just ruins your life and the life of so many people around you. He often succeeds at orchestrating one of these events early in our lives. And I have several stories that I'll use later on to illustrate this, but right now I just want to get the information out there. He gains such a stronghold that, uh, that he will then appoint devils to reinforce it. That wasn't the best written sentence I've ever constructed, but I think you get the idea. Once he establishes a stronghold, and once he sees that he's got you angry, he wants to keep you angry. And so he will then begin to provide lies and a kind of narrative he'll help you construct, or he will construct by seducing spirits, planting uh, heresies, false teachings, false things, lies in your mind, and then encourage you to rehearse that over and over and over. And you will rehearse the justification for your anger. Or you will rehearse the excuse for your anger. And you rehearse it over and over and over and over. And every time you rehearse it, it's like cinching down the straps. I told you how I was so blessed that when God decided to let my couch fall off my truck, he was kind enough to make sure nobody was under it when it fell into the street. Well, we had failed to cinch it down sufficiently, or actually, we never mind. We did, I did it wrong. I already explained that. When we put it back up there, we put it on the correct way, the way my son told me we should in the first place. We put it up there that way, and I did some things to make sure it was secure. And then, man, we cinched that down. You got these straps with the kind of handle, you know, you grab it right, you go like this, you go, mm, mm, right? And every time you do that, you get that thing tighter and tighter and tighter and I can almost pluck that thing and get the note E bing 
I got it so tight like a guitar string practically. And uh, that's what you're doing. Every time you rehearse why you're angry and you satisfy yourself that you have a right to be angry, and you go back over it again and again and again, or you work through the justification for your anger or the excuse for your anger. It's one of those two things, either to justify the anger or to excuse the anger. And, and you just keep cinching that down, making it tighter and tighter. And all you're doing is strengthening the devil's control of your life. You're simply strengthening the cords of lies Satan is using to bind you to that anger. That's all that's happening. You're not getting any freedom at all. You're not getting any satisfaction or any peace. It's just making things worse. If he gains such a stronghold, then those devils who are appointed to protect it will provoke you to get really mad at somebody who touches that strap. If somebody comes along and, and grabs that strap and wants to pull the little lever that loosens it, I'm overplaying that illustration, but you get the idea. If somebody comes along and starts messing with that and starts pointing out that you've got an anger problem, it's weird how the devils will just flare up because they got to protect that stronghold. That's a place in your life that they control and they don't want to give it up. So you'll become very defensive and strike back at anybody who's trying to touch that strap that's, that's tightened you so much, it has you so much in bondage to that thing. So remember, though, that Satan is a liar and the father of it. He commands seducing spirits to reinforce that stronghold with lies. He will use all sorts of lies, rationalizations, by which you will, as I've already pointed out, excuse or justify that anger. We can become very adept at, ha at hiding it. Some personalities are really good at hiding it. So their explosions are internal, not external. Uh, we, you know, we... Uh, I deal with anger issues, as you know, and I've talked to you about that quite a bit. But I tend to be very expressive, much to the chagrin of anybody within a mile of me. Well, I'm kidding around. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm more demonstrative in my personality where some people are not. They're very internal. They're very quiet. And they can be sometimes the more severely affected and, and the more thoroughly controlled. Um, either way is bad news. But when somebody's hiding it, it makes it harder. It, it's easier for them to skate without outside accountability. You know, a guy like me is going to get a lot of accountability. Because a lot of people are going to say, I don't like that behavior. So I'm going to get a lot of, <laughs> a lot of positive encouragement to take care of my problem. Am I right? Because it's out there. But you got somebody who is who's internal, who internalizes all of their anger, who internalizes all of that. They have explosions going on inside and you look at them and you don't even know what's happening. But what's happening in their case is, of course, it can happen in either case, in, in all cases, but in this, this particular situation is one where very often it's so intense and so severe they form a kind of just settled resignation to hatred and they just hate now they learn to mask that and they learn to function with it They're like functioning alcoholics in a, in, in a sense that somebody can have themselves under the power of alcohol and yet function pretty well in society and some people are able to function very well in society and nobody around them would really have a a real clear idea that they are a person that's full of anger. But God knows, and he's in their heart with them, and he watches the murder take place over and over and over. He watches murder happen. Because when we hate a brother in our heart, we are committing an act of murder. And so that person has a tendency to fantasize different ways, and uh, perhaps in other situations, uh, you know, hate that person in their heart and so commit murder. And then, again, they likewise will rehearse the rationalizations and do that repeatedly, justifying that anger, explaining to God and anybody else why that person deserves to be hated, and so on. 
The problem is it's not hurting them. It's not hurt. I shouldn't say that the problem is. <laughs> that's like saying if it was hurting them. That's not what I mean to say. <laughs> the, the fact is it's not hurting them. It's only hurting you. And God has given us a path for addressing offenses in Matthew 18. And we need to use it. Amen? We need to use that path that he has outlined for us in handling these offenses. And I, I won't go there now until we get into attacking these strongholds. I'll give you more information about that. Satan uses three favorite lies. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And the first lie that Satan uses to keep you bound to your anger-based stronghold is the lie that nobody knows the trouble I've known, I've seen, or however that song goes. Nobody knows the trouble. I can't even sing the song. Some of you are very glad. <laughs> so anyway, fact is, <laughs> we think it's a unique thing to us. This is just unique. I'm a unique person. It's a unique situation. Nobody else has a problem like this one. Uh, this is a, a very separate case. You don't understand. You just don't understand. My situation is unique. That's one of Satan's favorite lies. The Bible says there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So you need to believe the truth. You repent to the acknowledging of the truth. Because Satan is holding you in bondage to that anger with lies. And one of them is the vain idea that we're unique somehow. It's a special problem, just private, just between me and God. Nobody, you, you know, you think you understand. I know you do. And that kind of thing. It's a mistake. Because there is no temptation that has ever come upon you. But what is common to all mankind. And then here's the second lie. The Bible says God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. <clears throat> the second lie is, I, I can't, it's too much for me. It's overwhelming. I, and some people get driven into self-medication with alcohol or drugs and things like this because they feel so overwhelmed. They have no way, they think, to overcome all the rage and the uh, issues they deal with, and so they go find some way to, to do it that's not healthy, that makes things worse for them. But it's a lie. God is faithful. He has never allowed you to be tempted above that you are able. Now, I understand because I've been there, the experience is I have no strength to deal with this. And we'll talk about that. I know that in your experience, it feels like, looks like, acts like, seems like. There is a, every, everything you might look at in terms of sight would add up to one conclusion. No way. I'm powerless. And what you're going to find out that's interesting is that that's both true and untrue. And the problem is you got the wrong side of it. You have to understand, indeed, that you can't, but he can. And he has never allowed you to be tempted above that you are able. It never happened. Not one time. Here's the third lie. He will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape. There's nothing else I could do. That's the other lie. There's nothing else I can do. I had nowhere to turn. There was no, there was no way out. I was just abandoned and left in this situation. And there was no other way for me to proceed than to do this thing that I know the Bible says is wrong, but there was nothing else I could do. But the Bible says that's a lie. There's always a way out without sinning your way through it. There's always a way. One reason you can't see it is because you're stuck in the lie. If you're stuck lie, believing the lie, there's no way, there's just no way, there's no way, then you won't see. But if you repent to the acknowledging of the truth, I mentioned earlier how important that verse would be. 
if you will repent to the acknowledging of the truth, then those lies, like that strap, gets loose. And then you can begin to get free from that stronghold. Moses is an example of this. While he was called upon by God, the most meek man on all the earth, he nevertheless struggled with anger from time to time. And you might remember I pointed this out last time, that when Moses got angry, he disobeyed God. He came under the power and influence of anger. It took over his will, and he ended up acting contrary to God's will, to God's word. Now, earlier he had gotten angry. He threw down the tables of stone. He made him drink the golden calf dust. But that was anger under the control of God. That was different. Later, he became angry independently of God and acted contrary to God's will. So that's what you got to be careful about. Now, some of you might ask yourself from time to time, why is it that Satan just gets to walk in and take over like he, like he does in my life? Of course, we're focusing on anger right now, but this could go to so many other areas of your life. It could go to fear-based uh, strongholds. It could go to lust-based strongholds, and you can go through the whole list, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, hatred, wrath, the whole list. And you could pick whatever one is your troubling sin, your besetting sin. Remember the Bible talks about the besetting sin? Yours might be different than mine, but that sin that Satan uses in your life to trip you up so easily, and you know what it is, or you know what they are. There may be more than one. So um, when Satan, it just seems he can just walk in and just boom. It, it feel, anytime he wants to, he just boom, pull your trigger, and he's got you again. I won't ask for a show of hands because I'd have to raise mine. <laughs> and there are areas, some of you are wondering now, you go, oh, no. no. <laughs> Look, I won't judge you if you don't judge me. How's that? Does that work out okay for you? All right, good. No, we're all in flesh, and we struggle with these things. And I am going to be giving you some, some personal uh, testimonies that will really help kind of turn lights on, and you'll see more clearly exactly how this works. But I want you to get the information first so you understand it in the right context. But uh, it just sometimes feels like Satan can just do what he wants to do with your life. He just walks in, boom, pulls your triggers, he's got you. Man, that's frustrating. Satan has established a stronghold in your life. That's what that means. It means that he has got a landing place. It means that he has somehow or another worked out a place in your life that he controls. And it shows up. One good thing about God allowing that to happen is that God is saying to you, it's almost as if God is putting a sign up in that area of your life that says, stronghold here. That's what he's doing. You got the big heavenly fingers going point, 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 point. The lights are flashing. Satan's got a spot there. And if you'll, if you'll just catch that, it'll help you. If you'll just kind of, I mean, I, when I start giving you some of the stories that, that, I, that Becky will tell you, you know, there's, there's a part of this thing of fighting a stronghold where you, you learn that it's there, you identify it, and you address it when it shows up. You address it verbally, outside, right in front of God and everybody. You say effectively, there it is. And when you start doing that, it begins losing its power in your life, its ability to control you. So Satan has established a stronghold in your life if you're experiencing that. The issue has not been resolved You've got some kind of an event or series of events or an interpretation of an event. I mean, you'd be amazed. Sometimes I deal with people who have really no actual trauma in their life, but they've invented one. And it, because, see, remember, you know why people like darkness? Their deeds are evil. That's why they like it. So they'll construct a darkness as a justification and cover, they think, in their vanity, that covers their sin and allows them to go on in rebellion while they use that as a cover, but it doesn't fool God. And it really usually doesn't fool anybody around them either. It only fools themselves, typically. The issue has not been resolved in your life, and you need to get that resolved. And there's usually a deep root of bitterness that's grown 
and grown and grown and grown. And you keep breaking it off at the top. You hear a message like this one, perhaps, or some other sermon or whatever. You have a, a real need for God. You draw up close to him and everything. And you kind of pull the weed, as it were. But you just break it off. And the root is still there. And it isn't very long before it just comes back. And you're right back in the same place you were before. And I'm sure if I asked for a show of hands, some of you would go, yeah, I, I, I think I see what you're saying. That's what happens. Well, you need to learn how to get to the root of these things. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we go to assaulting these strongholds. Satan has appointed seducing spirits to guard that stronghold. Lies that hide it, usually from others, but it can also serve to hide it from you. You can have strongholds in your life you don't even know are there. And I've given you a testimony or two in my own life where I talk to you about that, but you'll, we won't take time to go into it right now, but we will later on. And then, of course, the lies that excuse and justify. Until you break the power of these devils over you, you're not going to be free. Usually it takes prayer and fasting to address. Because here's what happens. If Satan has enjoyed owning you or owning a part of you, and through that ownership, working into your family, working into your life and the world around you, and just doing some damage here and there and all that, uh, he's not going to give that up. So you start taking action to give it up. Then he swaps out a new devil. He calls off the, the lesser devils and sends you some more wicked devils. Remember, we helped you understand there are levels of devils. If he can keep you under his power with one of his little puny imps, then why waste a stronger devil on you? He owns you without that. So he just has a little annoying imp bother you. Then you start trying to address it, and then that imp starts getting hurt because you're praying too much and you're reading your Bible too much and all that kind of stuff starts happening. Well, Satan will call off that little imp and he'll send a bigger devil in there after you. And then they'll reinforce that thing and entrench themselves and your, your condition can even get worse in cases like that. And I've had Christians testify and say, you know, I started reading my Bible and going to church and it just got worse. Well, that's why. It's because the, say, the devils you were dealing with before were low-level devils. Now you've stepped up your game and Satan stepped up his. Now you're dealing with more powerful devils. But that also means you're gaining victory. It means you're making progress. You try to tell somebody that, it's like, it does not compute, right? They, they don't get it. Oh, that's good news. What? How can that be good? Oh, it means that the, the, the reinforcements have been coming in because you have been making some gains against that stronghold. And so Satan's going to send in some, some heavier devils. My friend in San Diego, as you've heard me say, says new levels, new devils, that's for sure. Even then, it is necessary that you become honest about the problem. You know, honesty with God. You've heard me say this so many times. Let me say it again. I might even say it again later. This needs to be said just repeatedly. Honesty is so key to any kind of relationship you're going to have with God or really anybody else. Honesty. You're going to have to get honest with yourself. And you're just going to have to go ahead and be honest with God because he knows anyway. Repentance and confession are essential as I begin to conclude now for this message. Repentance and confession are absolutely essential. Repentance, what does it look like? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now I rejoice, or 9, 9 through 11. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, people struggling with these strongholds, especially if they're sincere Christians and they love the Lord, and they're just struggling with this stuff, they can become very deeply depressed. They're so sorry that they behave this way, but they feel so powerless to do anything about it, and they just get more and more depressed. They have a worldly sorrow, though. It's a worldly sorrow that doesn't yield any good fruit. It only yields death. Now, a lot of suicides happen because of that. People just end up killing themselves. It's sad. But 
if it works a godly sorrow, then you have deliverance. For behold, the selfsame thing, Paul went on to say, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Well, what did that look like? Here it is. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. What zeal. What revenge. And all these things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. We will exp explore that more because that's applicable to any stronghold you're trying to assault. I introduce it here. We'll bring it up again when we talk about fear base. We'll bring it up again when we talk about lust base. But then we're going to explore it when we talk about assaulting these strongholds. But repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. Remember, we can give you the scripture of truth that will make you free, but you must repent to the acknowledging of that truth in order to, here's the key. You ready for it? Deliver yourself from the snare of Satan. Deliver yourself. Let me explain why that's important. I can pray for you, and in, in prayers for you, I've experienced this many, many times, I can pray for you, and you more than likely will experience some kind of relief, but it won't deliver you. Yeah, is it? that's that's the enemy, that's the devil. Uh, you you have access to a doctor. Yes. Okay, you might ask your, you might tell that to your doctor and ask him to give you some tests to make sure there's not a physiological problem going on. Low blood sugar will cause that. Oh, yeah. There are some physical things that can cause that. When you rule that out, yeah, it's just the devil. Amen. Amen. All right, so you must deliver yourself. From a snare of the devil. There are a lot of deliverance ministries out there. And some of them are really, really good. I think they, they're right on target. Some of them are flim flam. This, this idea, and that's why people come to you all the time and say, pray for me. Pray. And I do. And I believe in that. And I believe it does make a difference. And I believe that when I pray, for example, for my son or I pray for my wife, it makes a difference. I think when they pray for me, it makes a difference. When we pray for each other, it makes a difference. Did I say that? I did say that, didn't I? That praying for one another is essential. It's key. It's certainly a part of any deliverance you might have. We must pray one for another. I'm going to say it one more time to make sure it's said. Praying for each other makes a huge difference. But at the end of the day, at the bottom line, if you don't deliver yourself under the power of Christ, obviously, you're going to be right back in the same problem in a very short time. Please hear what I said. That verse we read earlier says that we preach to those who oppose themselves that they might repent to the acknowledging of truth and by that deliver themselves from the power of Satan. Now, there's a problem here because we spend a lot of time rightfully cautioning everybody, don't think you're going to do this in the flesh. You can't do it yourself. You can't do it. God can do it, right? And isn't that true? It's true. But it's also true that unless the sinner confesses with his mouth the Lord Jesus, believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead, and calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved, he won't get saved. So we can argue all day. It's God's the only one to save. You can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You don't have enough righteousness to save yourself. We can hammer that and hammer that and hammer that and hammer that. Uh, well, as they say, until the cows come home. At the end of the day, if the sinner doesn't repent and believe on Jesus, he won't get saved. Well, the same thing is true in these deliverance ministry situations. There's only so much we can do. You read that passage. We can preach the gospel with meekness, with fear. We can preach the gospel with passion. We can preach it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost from heaven. At the end of the day, if the sinner doesn't repent, the sinner doesn't get saved. They must repent to the acknowledging of the truth that they might deliver themselves from the power of Satan. And that's true in this situation as well. So Christian, until 
if you're dealing with a stronghold of anger in your life, until you come to a place where you acknowledge the lies that you have received from Satan and that you have used to stay in bondage to him, until you admit and confess that these are lies, that they're not true, and with a broken heart, come before God with genuine repentance that's, that would be described by what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Where there's such a turning in you of, of vehement desire, of, of passionate, uh, passionate crying out to God for deliverance until you get to a place where you bring the whole heart to the table. As you've heard me say so many times, God said, you'll find me when your whole heart shows up. That's when you'll find me. And you've heard me say this to you so many times. Just now we have a different application for it. God's hearing you come to him, and he's saying, okay, here she comes again. I don't know why I said she. Maybe there's a she here that needs to hear this. I don't know. <laughs> but here she comes again. She's come a little closer this time than she ever has before. This is looking hopeful. Come on. You got about three-fourths of your heart here. There's about a fourth of it that's still over there hanging on to that darkness. There's still a little bit of it that's hanging on to that lie. Come on. Come on. Let it go. Let go. Let go. Bring it all to me. And he's waiting for your whole heart to show up. And then when finally your whole heart shows up, there's this just a wonderful moment where that light goes on. Boom. It shines bright. And the darkness just goes. And you, you're free. And the, and the devils are hightailing it, screaming all the way. Because the moment one of his kids gets, draws near to him, and he starts drawing nigh to them. Didn't the Bible say that? Draw nearer to him, he draws nigh to you. So you come to him, he starts coming to you. You keep coming, he keeps coming. But you give up too soon. And here's the thing that's hard to take. It's the reason you give up too soon. You get so close, you, you are just about there where he's about to touch you as it were. And then the flesh loathing that nearness to God. Suddenly your mind goes, and you got other things to think about and it's time to go and you run away. And the father has got a broken heart. And you continue with a broken life. So he'll wait till next time. When you finally have had enough of it. And you come to him. For help. But hopefully this time. You'll stay there long enough. To get the help you need. Let's stand together please.